Welcome to tonight's lecture, uh, continuing in the series on economy. My name is John McMara. I'm the section head for architecture, and I'm pleased to see everyone here tonight. The series economy is a topic that we've been dealing with in the winter to a degree, maybe more so in the spring. And I think clearly the, the notion of economy is somewhat inspired by recent economic events where the notion of things needing to economize come into play because of everybody's um, budgetary issues. And so that's a bit of the initial inspiration. But I think the topic also f has a, a resonance as a way of thinking through a kind of system of difference and interrelation. And we sort of want to wish to suggest that perhaps rather than think through a kind of biological metaphor or an ecological metaphor, that we could use the notion of economy as a system of difference to think about issues related to design. So whether we think about the sort of psychic economy of somebody like Freud or the notion of a kind of political economy, that somehow economy in that it's a sort of distinguishing characteristics of man as opposed to nature in its imbued artificiality could provide a way of thinking through the artifactual nature of our own production in the school, whether it's in architecture, planning, or in landscape. And I think we've sort of held off this real engagement with the topic for precisely tonight's speaker. Tonight's speaker is Michael Speaks, and I can think of no other thinker in the field who has so systematically, to my own estimation at least, suggested the possibility of economic logics coming into an understanding of the logics of design itself. And, and I would say, this is perhaps best expressed through a kind of cursory um, reading of his CV. Um, I first knew of, of Michael's work uh, coming out of his dissertation, which he did at Duke University under um, Frederick Jameson. Uh, Michael's own work dealt with the kind of um, architects coming out of what was then known as deconstruction, people like uh, Shumi and uh, Kuhlhaus and Peter Reisemann but also looking at the implications of the work of the theorist uh, Manfredo Tafuri and in relationship, I would imagine, to his own advisor's work with Frederick Jameson, and tried to start to make a, a, an imagination of what the implications of that kind of theoretical inheritance was. He took that on to work that he did at the Netherlands Architecture Institute, most notably with the organization of the show Big Soft Orange, which to my understanding, was the first sort of international um, packaging of that work that was going on in the Netherlands in the, in the 90s based on a, a new sort of sensibility of design trying to deal with issues of urbanism, economy, logistics within the realm of design. Furthermore, Michael was then the director of graduate studies at SciArt, where he also started a program um, Metropolitan was in the title. I don't remember the full title, but it basically brought in to that school a, a sense of how you might deploy some of the techniques and technologies of consultancy and design thinking in relationship to a whole wide range of issues. And now finally, as he appears to us tonight as the Dean of the University of Kentucky, where he's taken that thinking and now applies it to a wide range of pedagogical and formative issues to the discipline. Uh, it's one of the pleasures of this series is that you get to, that I personally get to select sometimes people to come and speak. And, and Michael's work is somebody who I've followed over the last 10 years and have been a fervent admirer and follower of throughout its many permutations. And so it's with great pleasure that I ask you to welcome tonight Michael Speaks. Is this thing working? No, of course not. We'll have to turn it on. Oh. John just turned me on. Thank you, John. Wow. Come on, John. It's not going to be like that. Um, well, thank you, John. It, it's great to be back here after uh, maybe more than 10 years. The last time I was here was to lecture on um, Big Soft Orange, an exhibit we did uh, that traveled all over the 
all over the States and uh, some in Europe and was also actually exhibited here, but before you had this, uh, this new school. Um, anyway, it's, ter it's terrific to be back here. Uh, I, um, I want to sort of spin through a number of, of, um, of things, but I want to try to be, um, um, let's say, faithful to the topic of uh, economics uh, and design, but not too close because uh, it can get really, really boring very, very quickly. Um, I, I, I saw Jeff Kipnis uh, earlier today, and he asked me a question that I was afraid someone was going to ask me, which is, are you going to talk about the same thing you always talk about, what, about how you hate theory and how, you, how it's ended and how you used to be one of those people, and now you're so glad you're not one of those people? And um, I'm not going to talk only about that, but I can't help but talk a little bit about that. I was also, I have to say, a little worried and nervous that people here might have uh, heard some, some of these things before. Um, it's just vain and uh, not true. Um, and then I, I also was worried about, um, about saying something new, but I noticed that, that Beatrice Colomina is lecturing next week, and so I, I, that was put to rest. I, I didn't really worry much when I saw that Beatrice was lecturing here that I should say anything new, exciting, or relevant. So, okay. Um, I'm going to do a, a, a spin through a couple of things. I'm also going to read a little bit, uh, not because I can't do anything else. I mean, when I first started to lecture, I read a lot because I was frightened. Uh, now I read because I'm not frightened, and also because I write really, really beautifully. And I, I think you'll enjoy. I think you'll really enjoy some of my some of the text that I'm going to read you tonight. I'm going to do a kind of a this is, a, this is a, who I am, Michael Speaks. I'm a dean of the College of Design, actually, at the University of Kentucky. Um, we're a college of design as of about five years ago. We were a college of architecture for a long time. We broke away, uh, unlike you, unfortunately, perhaps, from engineering about 50 years ago. Um, so we've been free of, of engineering for some time. Although I will say lots of good things about engineering, especially at the end of the lecture. Um, I do a little, uh, kind of a little morality tale uh, Pichacucha style, like four images. I don't really have to say anything. The story will be very obvious, I think. Um, there's one image. Um, there's another one. Another image. Another one. And then, then there's that one. Um, well, so you know what the story is, the economic downturn, depression, no jobs, um, and there have been lots of different kinds of reactions to that. I mean, it's had a profound uh, effect on design and on design professions, especially architecture. Over the last year, architecture offices, large and small, have been forced to downsize and rethink not only their practice but their business models. Um, less fortunate offices, even those of long standing, uh, have been forced out of business altogether. And architecture and design education uh, has, not, uh, has also been impacted by this. Public and private universities alike have faced and continue to face budget cuts, hiring freezes, and reduced funding as elected officials struggle to balance state and municipal, and municipal budgets. I've been an, a dean at the College of Design for two years, and we've been cut uh, there by the state and then by the university in turn by first 2%, 4%, and then another 4%. So my operating budget since I arrived is 8% less than it was when I arrived, and it was anemic when I, w when I arrived. So this is, a, this is an issue that we all face right now. It has to do, uh, well, and, and there are a lot of things that, 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 you know, that face design education today. We, we have to make arguments for the ways in which design adds social, political, cultural, and economic value in ways that we haven't before. Um, we have to do that by doing outreach uh, and also uh, by doing a lot more fundraising. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated, very complicated story. Um, uh, you know, uh, meanwhile, uh, while, while all this uh, has been going on, while this has been going on, um, there have been a lot of reactions on the part of, uh, of a lot of organizations, uh, especially uh, this one, uh, Architecture for Humanity, you, you may know this group, uh, Cameron Sinclair's organization, uh, Design Like You Give a Damn. Architecture, it's, a, it's an odd organization. Architecture for Humanity, it's called. I, it's hard to imagine architecture against humanity. It's a, it's a kind of a weird, and, and their, their watchword is Design Like You, like you Give a Damn. 
Um, been a lot of publications, a lot, especially out of Metropolis Magazine, a lot of publications that deal with the ethical imperative now that design faces. Um, now, this, there have been a lot of debates and discussions, especially in the New York Times. Uh, TED, if you watch the TED uh, video lectures, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of arguments like the one I was just referring to have been uh, uh, offered there. Um, the Huffington Post, there was a huge set of debates between Architecture for Humanity and uh, the eminent critic of the New York Times, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. Um, mostly critiques of the excesses of architecture, and by that they mean specifically by the kind of orchidaceous, wild, weird forms that have pr been produced by the star architecture system over the last 10 or 15 years. It's been this hardcore discussion and an and attempt to devalue what many people call high design. Um, and I think architecture for humanity has been one of the kind of leading forces uh, in, that, in that critique. Oddly enough, the, the, the critic of the New York Times has also engaged in uh, some, uh, let's call it self-criticism and adjustment. Um, the esteemed uh, critic of the Arch of New York Times uh, in late 2008 began a subtle series uh, of self-criticisms and adjustments by criticizing the very same architects that during better economic times he had made a career fawning over. I mean, this is a guy who essentially made a career claim, uh, making great claims for the work of Zaha Hadid, Peter Eisenman, uh, Rem Koolhaas, Herzog de Meuron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in this piece, he actually starts to go the other way. Uh, you may remember his opening salvo of fervor, moralistic fervor, and newfound interest in infrastructure and the homeless. Um, it began with a wonderfully entitled and quite revealing New York Times article entitled Architecture. It was fun until the money ran out. Decem it was in December, uh, December 21st, 2008. Uh, Arusov uh, writes, who knew a year ago that we were nearing the end of one of the most delirious eras in modern architectural history. What's more, who would have predicted that this turnaround brought about by the biggest economic crisis in half a century would be met in some corners with a guilty sense of relief? <coughs> Before the financial cataclysm, the profession seemed to be in the midst of a major renaissance. Architects like Rome Koolhaas, Frank Gehry, Zaha Hadid, Jacques Herzog, and Pierre uh, de Moron, once deemed too radical for the mainstream, were celebrated as major cultural figures, and not just by high-minded cultural institutions. They were courted by developers who once scorned these talents as pretentious airheads. This is just the same article. Um, but somewhere along the way, that fantasy took a wrong turn. I'm reading from Arusov. I hope you realize this. I, I wouldn't have written this article. Um, as commissions multiplied for luxury residential high-rises, high-end boutiques and corporate offices in cities like London, Tokyo, Dubai, and more socially conscious projects rarely materialized, public housing, a staple of 20... And, 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 and the oddity, of course, he, is that he never said these things during this period in which he was touting the great architects, the star architecture system, jetting around, no doubt, seeing their buildings and having caviar and bubbly drinks uh, sponsored by their sponsors. Public housing, a staple of 20th century modernism, was nowhere on the agenda, nor were schools, hospitals, or public infrastructure. Serious architecture was beginning to look like a service for the rich, like private jets and spa treatment. Now that high-end high end bubble has popped, and it, now that I, high end the bubble has popped, and it is unlikely to return anytime soon. Jean Nouvel, 75 story residential tower adjoining the Museum of Modern Art, has been delayed indefinitely. This is, he wrote this in 2008. And developers now seem loath to undertake similar projects. Even if the economy turns around, the public's tolerance for outsized architectural statements that serve the rich and self absorbed has already pretty much been exhausted. Um, now, what's interesting, what I found interesting about this is that uh, there immediately be began a kind of a uh, I'm more moral than you discussion uh, around Nikolai's piece. Uh, Architecture for Humanity uh, uh, founder Cameron Sinclair wrote this article in which he basically said, I don't know what you were doing for the last few years, uh, Nikolai, but we were working. We were, we were actually building projects and doing all the things that you say we should do now. 
Um, and then uh, he wrote another piece. All these things kind of came out on the Huffington Post and other, other places. Finally, Francis Anderton, a journalist in Los, Ange in Los Angeles who has a terrific radio show, s said, this is absolutely stupid. Um, why should we think of these two things as mutually exclusive? High design and doing good don't have to be mutually exclusive. One is not evil, the other is not necessarily good. Um, and let's get on with something else. Um, what's, what I find even kind of more interesting is that Orusov has continued with these kind of, this piece is, this is his most recent piece, uh, whose title I think is even more precious. Uh, it's a piece he wrote just this last week um, and it's devoted to an architect that he liked at one time for one reason and when he discovered that he was doing things that he didn't realize, he likes him even more now uh, for, for other kind of reasons. Um, to see how, just how far this critic uh, has come during the intervening year and, one and a half, one e only need review his most recent New York Times piece design, entitled Designed to Uplift the Poor a wonderful uh, little piece that tells the story of how former Gary associate Michael Maltzen, even during those long nights spent before the drawing board uh, designing residences for the rich and famous, harbored a desire to help the homeless in his city. This is a, this is a homeless uh, shelter, or uh, it's an SRO essentially, um, designed by Michael Maltzen. I think that's just been completed. It's actually really quite nice. It's really, it's an exciting building and it's thrilling. And if you know downtown LA, uh, you know there's, it has the largest homeless population living outside, 10,000 people on a 15 square block area in downtown. That's not in the SROs, that's outside. So one welcomes this kind of thing, but it's, but when did Nikolai get this religion? I mean, it's a, it's a, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of jumping on the bandwagon uh, and a kind of a moralizing and a, and a, I think a, a, a sad sort of criticizing of design, of high design, that's unnecessary. And lots of people have jumped on, have jumped on this. Um, I, I would say, uh, unlike a lot of these critics, and like a lot of uh, people who are criticizing high design, that we don't need less design. We actually need more. We need 10,000 times more design. We need more design, not less design. Uh, but in the current economic situation, that will, that will mean that design, more than ever, will need to prove its value, or to be more precise, now more than ever design will be required to show how it adds economic value. And there are two ways uh, this can be done. I want to show some images and talk about two examples of this, and then I want to uh, give context to another example, which is really the, the, the subject of my talk. Um, this is a, a project I think that the lecturer from last week just showed. Uh, well, actually two weeks ago. I think Jesse was here a couple of weeks ago. It's a Taiwan pop music uh, uh, center. Uh, he, they, uh, his firm, RUR, just won the competition a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's an example of how in a, in a booming economy and in a part of the world where high design is still appreciated, design can, rad, can add real economic value to the city and to the state. This is a building that will house um, a pop music archive, will have four to 6,000 uh, 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 people in a huge performance area, some indoor performance areas, and will essentially be the means by which Taiwan uh, continues to hold its, let's say, power over the popular music industry in the Mandarin speaking world. As you know, uh, Hong Kong, is really where the film industry is in, ta in Taiwan and Taipei in particular is where the pop music industry is. Anyway, this is, a, this is a hundred and tw about a $120 million building. The money is, are, is in the hands of the government. It was, a, it was an open competition, uh, RUR1, and it adds enormous economic value to the national economic equation, or at least it's believed to do so uh, to, to the extent that they gave $120 million and put it on the table to build it. I think it's an incredible proposal um, I hope Jesse talked about, did, did Jesse show this last week? Yeah, okay, so you've seen, um, so here are more images of it. So I, I think this idea that high design should go away and is still not economically viable, I think is just nonsense. Uh, and, and I hope we don't forget that. There are other ways to, to show how design 
can add value, and this really happens more at the university level. Um, I'm going to talk about three, talk very quickly about three small projects or projects we're doing at the University of Kentucky at the College of Design, specifically, more specifically in architecture. This is a project we did uh, f uh, in Louisville. Um, it's, a, it's a redesign for the west side, for the waterfront. Um, the idea for the larger uh, proposal was uh, how could design add economic value to this really run down uh, part of the city. Um, they, the students proposed uh, six projects. One is a green Ford motor plant that spans the river, two are campuses. Um, I don't want to go into these, but these are just, these are, these, are, these are kinds of arguments that schools, I think, have to make. We, in particular, have to make. Uh, and we have to show how it is that our design is not just exquisitely beautiful and powerful, but how it can add economic value for city. Um, this is a final model. These are, these are other, some other projects we're doing uh, to, to make arguments that design also can add value at the product and commercial level. Um, we're doing a lot of work with the Center for Applied Energy Research at the University of Kentucky. They basically do a lot of research trying to understand uh, how uh, to use byproducts of uh, coal fire uh, power plant uh, use. In other words, what do you do with the material when you scrub coal plants? Uh, uh, and we're actually doing a lot of design work using those materials. These are 95% this, these are dry ash with an organic binder. Um, and we're making a whole series of products, some of them uh, we hope are going to be commercially available at some point. But anyway, we're, we're developing a lot of these kinds of products. Um, these are just a, a couple of quick images of another project we're working on uh, that, that is, in a way, incredibly unambitious, seemingly design-wise initially. It doesn't look like Zaha. It doesn't look like Jesse. It doesn't even look like cool fly-ash bowls. Um, but, it, but it adds enormous economic value for the state of Kentucky. Uh, and therefore, uh, for our students, and, uh, and, and, it, and it puts us in a very good position to make arguments that design adds economic value. These, we're, we're designing this year um, three deliverables for an investment company. Um, uh, uh, one is a unit, a thousand square foot unit, that, uh, where the, the power use will be a dollar a day. It'll be $58,000 unit. Um, uh, we're also designing neighborhood designs for these and retrofitting a, um, an assembly plant in Somerset, Kentucky, where formerly they produced custom-built houseboats, very expensive houseboats, two, three, four, five million dollar houseboats. What's happened is the, the economic uh, center of this region in the southern, southeastern part of Kentucky around Cumberland Lake um, was really driven by the manufacture of these houseboats. That industry has gone belly up, and there are only, out of 12 houseboat manufacturers, there are only two left. And we're actually working with an investment company to build these units, many of which will be consumed in the state of Kentucky. I think we're the sixth largest consumer of um, mobile homes and these in prefabricated housing in the country. So the units will be consumed in Kentucky. They'll be manufactured in Kentucky. In Kentucky. Hopefully, we'll put back to work many of the workers whose skills can be transferred from high-end houseboat manufacturer to the manufacturer of these products. And we're also creating a Kentucky-based value chain of products, many of which are made from recycled materials, tobacco, a lot of agricultural products, even fly ash being used uh, for countertops and other kinds of products. So the idea is to make arguments that design can add real economic, cultural, and social value to situations that might not have been so apparent not too, too long ago. These are just floor plans of that, sorry. Now, uh, there's, a, there's another way, I think, that, that one can argue um, for design today without falling into this kind of moralistic critique um, one way I just suggested is to say that the object itself, either small objects or big objects like uh, RUR's proposal for the, Thai, uh, for the Taiwan uh, Pop Music Center, that those objects add economic value. <laughs> There's another way to argue um, for the value of design today, 
And that's to argue that design itself, or what's, been, what's come to be called design thinking, is an incredibly powerful tool and engine of innovation. And by innovation, I mean the production of things that were heretofore not here, but that can be commercialized and used and can become useful in society. Um, this is just an insight that our high-minded, high-design friend, uh, Philippe Stark, uh, uh, also suggests in his re kind of imagining of where his own work is going. He's focusing a lot on innovation, invention, and production. Um, you see, uh, uh, one of the most promising uh, developments in this area of making an argument for design as a value adder that has to do with innovation, um, uh, and one that affects not only practice but education, is the growing recognition that design is not only a product, it's not just a table, a building, an urban plan, or a landscape, but it's also a creative process and a powerful engine of innovation. This could be the proverbial silver lining in the cloud, a chance to turn crisis into opportunity, but that will only occur if educators and practitioners are able to transform societal recognition uh, of this new value for design into action. Oddly enough, in education, the leaders uh, in this area have not been schools of design, but rather schools like the Rotman School of Management in Toronto, Canada, which is uh, represented by here by Roger Martin, who is the incredibly inventive dean of the college who went there from uh, Monitor Consulting and then McKinsey to completely reinvent the, the management school at Rotman using design and design thinking as a, as a major part of the curriculum. They're hiring designers to teach in the MBA program, for example. Um, and the, and I, I hope to make it clear why they think this is important. But also, uh, in schools like this, the, the, the uh, US War College in, uh, in Kansas, they're teaching design thinking. We're, we're not teaching design thinking in design schools. But they're teaching it in the business schools, and they're teaching it here. Uh, it's a pretty interesting school uh, for those who would poo-poo and think this is theoretically unsophisticated. I would, I, would, I would ask you to go to the footnotes and you will see that they've read more Manuel de Landa, Gilles Deleuze, Martin Heidegger, A, B, C, D, E, F, G than probably all of us here put together. They know their stuff, but they're focusing on design thinking and I want to try to uh, make a case for why that is. It's another school you may know about it, an engineering school at uh, Stanford University called the D School, where design thinking is al has also become a real kind of centerpiece um, of the curriculum. <laughs> now, this, uh, this, this approach, design thinking, has become crucial to such a variety of schools precisely because it offers a structured approach to innovation. One can begin to understand the rewards of design thinking by reference to a distinction made by Peter Drucker between the, the, the now uh, deceased, but uh, probably the inventor of contemporary management uh, thinking and theory, uh, a, a distinction he makes between problem solving, which answers questions with, 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 with which, I'm sorry, uh, uh, stop. Uh, between problem solving, which answers without questioning the problem and therefore adds nothing new, and innovation, which interrogates and reforms the problem and adds value by creating new knowledge and new products not anticipated in the problem. Drucker basically says there's, just, there's, a, there's a really clear distinction he wants to draw between problem solving and innovation. Problem solving, if you come to me with a problem and I simply complete your problem, if you come to me with an if you come to me with a commission, an architectural commission, you want a, a, a house with a red roof and green windows, and I say, okay, I can do that. And I give you a house with red roof and green windows. I haven't added any value, and therefore you as an architect are worth just about what they probably pay you uh, to make designs, which is not very much. You haven't added anything to the equation. You haven't added value. Drucker says innovation works by a different logic. When you come to me with a problem, I say to you, because I have a built-up reservoir of design knowledge about the specific problem that you're bringing to me, that I actually offer 
to, I, I, I add value by helping you reformulate the problem that you've actually come to me with. So you come to me with a problem with a red roof and a, and a green window, and I say, you know, I don't think you need a house at all. You need two houses. Um, or you need to make it out of wood. Or you need it to, in other words, I, I bring my knowledge and I help you kind of reformulate the problem. And having done so, I don't simply answer your, your problem. I actually add value by helping you reformulate the problem. I'll get a little bit. I'll get to that a little bit more um, l later on. This is this is a there. There are a ton of books being written now about design thinking. A lot of them uh, written by management thinkers. Some by architects. Peter Rowe uh, from Harvard uh, wrote a book called Design Thinking about 15 years ago. But it has nothing to do with this. It's it's interesting, but it has absolutely nothing to do with this. So don't get lost on that. Tim Brown is a it's one of the pioneers at IDEO, the product design and innovation company, the company that, that, that invented the mouse. Um, this guy is probably the most important of, the, of, peop, you know, of, of those writing essays and articles and books about this right now. <coughs> now, this is the part that Jeff can stop playing with his iPhone and pay attention to because, um, <laughs> because he, he will now recognize something that he ho was hoping that I wouldn't talk about earlier. Um, I want to try and give some context to, to this bit about design thinking by rehearsing a little historical discussion about what I want to call um, a new intellectual paradigm that we live in today that has, in which the relationship between thinking and doing has changed dramatically. And it's changed in part by technology, but it's also changed under pressure to innovate. And I'm going to do this now. Don't, you know, if people leave, I understand. But don't leave immediately after I put the slide up. Because when you put a slide like that up, people freeze and they, and they run away very quickly. This is a, this is a, and <laughs> if you listen for long enough, you'll see why. Um, uh, it's a little historical argument. Uh, my tra I was trained uh, as a Marxist cultural critic. I was trained by the best commies American universities could buy. Um, so I know political economy very well, and I was also trained by people who were essentially Hegelians, and we fought it and fought it and fought it, but we always have to do three of everything. So you'll, you'll forgive me that I, ne I need three to make things, to, to, to make it work. So secretly, I'm really a Hegelian, but I'm not really a Marxist. I'm a market communist, if, 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 if there is such a thing. Let's just say this. It, there's a historical argument I want to make, and it has to do with the changing nature of the economy, but it also has to do with the changing nature of what I want to call the intellectual dominant, which really has to do with a different relationship between thinking and doing, thought and action. Um, I'm not going to belabor this. I want to focus on the bottom part uh, down here. Um, the, the, the basic argument simply is this, that, that um, and this has to do with a, a lot of critiques that a lot of people have been making for the last 20 years. The whole post-structural thing, Jacques Derrida, De Lille, uh, the whole Heidegger, the whole thing was about nothing more than putting it into the Enlightenment and its ability to understand some kind of fundamental truth. Well, this is an argument over here. This, this, little, this little column over here is about the Enlightenment. It's about the ability for, uh, for thinkers to discover true truths. Yeah? They are looking for essences. And in the equation like this, there is even when things appear to be false, there is always some more fundamentally true thing down below. There is some truth to be found. It's, it's, it's really there. You just have to find it. Um, it corresponds with, a, with an economic paradigm in which uh, in which modernization itself was driven mostly by nation states. The, the production of, of goods, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was an economy that was producing goods, and it was an industrial-based economy. What happens from the 1960s to the 1990s is this whole thing gets critiqued and gets called into question. This is, it's this period that if your professors are confused, has confused them, yeah? Because they have read too many books and they've, and they've been too involved in these kind of critiques, I would say, for the last 15 years or so. Part of what's happening in this, in, in, in this economically is that we move from a situation where the driver is no longer nation states, but it's multinational corporations. 
The, uh, the, the, the economic paradigm is one where services have replaced uh, goods and where in the intellectual paradigm, philosophy and its ambition to discover some absolutely for sure essence or truth has been replaced by theory. Theory's ambition, strangely enough, is not to get rid of truth. It's to critique philosophy's ability to, to, to discover some fundamental truth. And in fact, what theory wants to do is, is to be engaged in a continuous critique of anything that asserts a fundamental or universal truth. So this is what this paradigm is about. And what happens is, in the whole true-false equation, Weirdly enough, the theory paradigm always prefers the false because it actually provides a really good way to, prov to prove there is no essential, absolute, universal truth. It's over here that I'm interested in, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But let me just say, uh, this, this, has a, a this has parallels um, in, this, uh, in the bottom part of this equation, this red part. It has parallels, and it has to do with the relationship between thought and action, yeah? Um, let's, just, let's just say in modernism, the ambition was to discover the ideals, the, tr the truths that never change. That's why modernists go back to the Greeks. That's why philosophers go back to fundamental principles. This is why, we, this is why Husserl goes back to Descartes, to first foundations. Thought always guides action. Truths guide action. And in modernism, uh, it's driven by manifestos that are written by people who foresee into the future, know the future, and guide us and tell us where to go. Vanguards are these people. We, know, we all know some of them. Today, they typically smoke clothes, cigarettes, and wear berets. Um, but not, there aren't even many of those people left. In this middle period, what happens is there's a critique made of this fundamental truth. And the ideals of modernism the ideals where there was some sense that there was this absolute universal truth, it gets replaced by ideology. But what doesn't get replaced is the relationship between thought and action. Thinking still guides doing. Critique still guides action. What critique does is it reveals new truths. Um, and if you've ever heard Mark Wigley talk, you'll know exactly what I mean. Or maybe you won't, because you may not have understood anything he said. Um, now, modernist manifestos are replaced during this period by a whole series of ideological uh, uh, manifestos, but they're not manifestos in the sense that they believe in some universal truth. They believe in critiques that result in those. Postmodernism, deconstructivism, folding, critical regionalism. My favorite, of course, is crypto delusion materialism, and that's any book with a Sanford Quinter introduction. That's a whole, uh, that's an ideology in and of itself. And it's a beautiful ideology, but it is an ideology. Here, the utopian vanguards are replaced by theory vanguards <laughs> or pomo rearguards. What I'm going to argue is that something fundamentally has changed over here. And what the real, the real change is that thought no longer guides action. Thought becomes a form of action itself. Thinking and doing become an iterative process where... Uh, manifestos are replaced by models of design thinking, I want to argue, and where vanguards disappear altogether and are replaced by intelligencers. Now, we all know this in architecture, this is Le Corbusier, this is the whole panoply of modernist ideals uh, that we all know, love, and some of us even believe in still. Ideologies, of course, People like Bernard Chumi, who even in a black and white photograph has a red scarf. Very powerful. That's an incredibly powerful ideology. Um, the classic example is Eisenman versus Leon Creer. My ideology uh, is better than yours. Um, so, and then, of course, uh, postmodernism manifests itself as a form of ideology. Portuguese's uh, 1980. Uh, presence of the past, Venice Biennale. 80 was really the moment that postmodern ideologies kind of get born. The constructivist, the constructivism is an ideology. Folding is an ideology, uh, for sure. Absolutely no question about it. What is intelligence? What is this third thing um, that I want to talk about where the relationship between thought and action is different and where knowledge 
which in the philosophical model was absolute truth, and in the middle model, the 60s to the 90s, was ideology. I want to say there's a new product. There's a new form of knowledge here, and I want to, and I'm, I'm going to, I want to call it intelligence. What do I mean by that? Um, there are a lot of pop science studies, a lot of people speculating about these kind of ideas. There's an interesting book written by a guy named Jeff Hawkins. <coughs> you may know him. He's the inventor of the uh, Palm Pilot software, then the case itself, then later the visor. Uh, he made a lot of money and he went back to school. He uh, did a PhD at Berkeley and he wrote this book as a result. Um, and his, what, he, what he was interested in was um, how, uh, how the mind worked, how we think. How, what he wanted to know was how do we make intelligent agents? How do we make intelligent devices? What he, what he did not believe is that intelligence was a huge accumulation of knowledge. That's the AI model. What he, what he, what he thought was that knowledge is in fact constantly changing, but it is always plausibly true. It's not ever absolutely true or false, but it is always possibly true. And I'll try to get to that, because that's the real distinction between ideals, ideology, and intelligence, is that intelligence is neither true nor false. It might be true. That's, what's, that's why it's powerful. That's what it's, now, what Hawkins talks about, um, and is that he, he says that intelligence really, human intelligence is manifest through two operations. He says that intelligence is measured by the capacity to remember and to predict patterns in the world, including language, mathematics, physical properties of objects, social situations. Your brain receives patterns from the outside world, stores them as memories, and makes predictions by combining what it has seen before with what is happening now. Prediction is not just one of those things your brain does. It is the primary function of the neocortex and the foundation of all intelligence. What he says is this, is that your mind is, stores patterns. And when you wander around in the world, your mind projects those patterns in the form of predictions. And when, when, you, when your mind encounters things that are, do not accord with those patterns, new information is then rewritten in the form of new patterns. So basically, what, you're, what your brain is constantly doing is projecting either having those projections confirmed or new information is being added um, when that information doesn't accord with what it finds. I don't even care if it's true. I mean, of course, I can't really care if it's true because I don't believe in truth. I believe that it could be true. So if it could be true, I'm interested in it. Could be true, and therefore it's kind of interesting. The idea is that knowledge is not fixed. It's constantly, constantly changing, but not because the knowledge itself is changing, but because what is produced as knowledge is constantly changing. I think that's, that's the exciting part. Um, there, are, uh, there are some other examples that you probably would know that will, will kind of help make sense of this. In 1971, the very first digital spreadsheet was invented. It was called VisiCalc. Um, <laughs> and it allowed people to do something that they never had been able to do before, which is to say, if John has a company and I have a company, and uh, I want to sell John my company, I'll, before the digital spreadsheet, our, uh, we'd have to sit down with 15 accountants and they would have to sort through all of our stuff. But if that company was an oil company and the price of crude goes down overnight, the value of my company will have to be recalculated again by those 15 accountants. What a digital spreadsheet allows you to do, and this is the subject of this piece, is to produce what this writer calls a spreadsheet form of knowledge. That is to say, if you, and of course, it's so secondhand now and so taken for granted and so ubiquitous that we don't even think about this. But what you can do with a spreadsheet is run a bunch of parameters in, put a, n a bunch of numbers in, and then speculate about what the price of something would be if these conditions obtained. So if this and this and this happened, this is what it would be worth. Well, Levy calls, this is a business writer from the 80s, wrote this piece. Uh, he says that that form of knowledge that's produced in that speculation is neither true nor false, but it might be true. Because it could be true. It's all based on if. If this and this and this, this is what it would look like. Well, I hope you can see the relationship between that and design, because that's all you do in a studio. You give them parameters, and you speculate, given those parameters, that it would look like this. You just don't do it all the time. And that's what, so, so this is a form of knowledge uh, that's not fixed, that's constantly evolving, uh, that's neither true nor false, but that might be true. Now. Uh, just, to, just to add a little levity here, and I, I'm not, I don't think my machine is mic'd, so I'll have to put this down. There, 
there's a episode down so you can hear it. Uh, I'm going to play you this, uh, like a 30, like a 10 second videotape. Far a videotape. Give me a second. Just give me this over here. Far <laughs> videotape. Um, uh, this is a, 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 an interesting concept or an idea. Bel believe it or not, bullshit is, bullshit is an incredibly interesting idea. Um, it's a, oops, sorry. Uh, this is a book published about four or five years ago by a moral philosopher at Princeton University called, uh, his name is Harry Frankfurt, called On Bullshit. What's interesting about the idea is that Frankfurt says there are three kinds of people in the world. There are people who tell lies, there are people who tell the truth, and there are people who tell, who are bullshitters. Now, the people who, who tell the truth are people who know the truth and will tell it to you. They're honest. Liars also know the truth. They try to cover over the truth by fabricating a lie. So they're productive. The people who tell the truth are the least productive. They're just simply telling you what they know. The liars are producing a lie to cover over the truth. The bullshitter is the most inventive. Because the bullshitter doesn't give a shit about the truth itself. He could care less. What he wants to do is to tell you a story and get you to buy in because he wants to get you to do something else. I want to say the bullshitter is like the ideologist. Now, Frankfurt has three categories. I have a fourth category that I want to call the intelligencer. And, I want to, and, and once I play Frankfurt's little video, uh, I hope I can convince you why. Okay, what, just, I have to do this. What is your theory of bullshit? What is bullshit? Well, it's a system of you can't hear it. Hang on. concern for the difference between... Oh, okay, but we'll have to start this over because it's just too, it's too beautiful not to do it. This is the best. If you didn't come for anything else, if you want to leave after this, I, I, would, I would understand. This is worth hanging around for. What is your theory of bullshit? What is bullshit? Well, it consists in a, in a lack of concern for the difference between truth and falsity. The motivation of the bullshitter is not to say things that are true or even to say things that are false, but he's serving some other purpose. And the question of whether what he says is true or false is really irrelevant to his pursuit of that ambition. The bullshitter is not necessarily a liar. What he says may very well be true, and he may... Uh, not think that it's false. I, I was careful to try to uh, make a distinction between, make, make clear the difference, as, as I understand it, between bullshitters and liars. Now, I, w what I want to say is that, like this group of ideologists from the 60s to the 90s, um, well, I'm going to say that, that they are basically bullshitters because they're not really interested in the truth itself. What they want to do is to convince you there's no, tr no fundamental truth, and they want to sell you something else. They want to get you to go along with their agenda. I would submit that's in fact what ideology itself does and that's what it is. Now intelligence does something else because intelligence is not interested in what's true or false, nor is it really interested in selling you something. It is simply interested in the production of, true, of things that might be true. Let me, let me give you another little uh, example of how that might work. Here's a piece written by, uh, by a woman, uh, Fena Hakmo Wagner, who's uh, Rem Kuhlhauser's niece, and she was working in a, uh, in a competition on OMA's team. They were working with Herzog and Zimmer on a project for Astor Place in New York. And uh, after the whole project was over, she wrote this really interesting little piece um, that's in uh, one of Rem's publications. Um, and, and what she says is, is, is this. She focuses on, is this the first time you've heard me all night? Oh my God. Um, she focuses on these things. And if you know anything about OMA, you've seen these things before. They're models, but they're blue foam or models. She says this about models, because models are a way of producing this form of knowledge I want to call intelligence. She says, in Rotterdam, ideas are never judged before they are materialized. The intellectual level of our labor is extremely low. We generate models without censure. Rim accepts no assumptions. He only wants evidence and lots of it. Most models look clumsy and rough. We cannot spend a day building an exquisite model in the wood shop if we have to make 10 more the next morning. Jock needs instant perfection. He has a vision and he doesn't take shit. This is, this is really becoming a theme in the talk. I, I apologize. 
Um, even in the very first stage of the design, concepts come with built-in details and reality checks. Models must have a tangible surface. Shock touches and examines the models as if shopping for shirts. What do you think? Does this one look good on me? The point is that for OMA and for FENA in the early part of the essay, models are means of producing design knowledge. For Herzog, models are ways of completing an idea that Herzog has already. Models are representational. They're not productive. We, I think that's a very, very, it's a, it's a dramatically different idea of what models can do. I, I would say that one of the more interesting examples of this obsession with models and the ways in which models produce knowledge is this essay that's, uh, that uh, Ben Van Berkel and Caroline Boss produced in their most recent book. It's called Design Models. It's an interesting idea. What they say is, look, we have an office that's about 15 years old now. Um, we have, it's, this is the book, Design Models. I would encourage everybody to get this if you don't have it. What they say is, we uh, look at all of our work from the last 15 years, and we've gotten to a certain size. We can't design every project. We do lots of competitions. We have a lot of uh, clients coming to us wanting us to do initial work on projects. What, what, we've, what we've done is we've looked back at the 15 years of work, and in a form of pattern recognition, we've discovered that there are about nine models into which all of our work can fit. Everything we do fits into these nine models. It's an interesting idea because what they say is when they get a new project or when they do a competition, they will take one of these models as a primitive and in fact use that model as a way to initiate the project. And as the project goes forward, that model gets more robust and new information gets added to it. Um, and these are the, the various kind of models. Now, I, I just wanted to say that this is, I think, one of the more interesting super or very contemporary ideas of this, but, we, but we've seen this now happening for the last seven or eight years. And I would argue that in this period from the end of the 90s to now, architects say 35 to 50 years old, um, 50 is important because I'm 50, um, uh, uh, that, that they're all engaged in this, pro in this project of producing intelligence. Um, you probably will recognize a lot of these books. These are the books that are produced by most of the firms that we all know today, and they are huge, fat books. These are not philosophical treatises. These are not ideological manifestos. These are books jammed, filled with intelligence, with knowledge produced by these offices, sometimes it's scripting, Sometimes it's an atlas of novel tectonics. These two, of course, should disqualify because I think Sanford wrote the introductions to them, but still. Um, and this is maybe one of the more famous examples, which is FOA's uh, arc. Uh, it's nothing more than, a than an assemblage of produced knowledge that FOA generated from, from, from this project. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, end or, or close by reading something extremely beautiful. Um, and it's about this, um, it's about one of the most important, I think, design thinkers that we still have. Although we don't have him anymore, we have this book. Peter Rice, uh, an Irish engineer, uh, worked for Ove Arab, did a lot of great projects. If you can get your hands on this book, uh, do so. It's about 750 bucks on the after, uh, m on the market on, uh, Amazon. But I, I just, I want to read a little bit about Rice and about the distinction that Rice draws between the design thinking that architects engage in and the, architect and the design thinking that engineers engage in. Because Rice is very much going to argue uh, in a way, I think, for what I'm calling intelligence. Um, he's going to argue that one can only add design knowledge if you, or, or one can only produce innovations if you have built up um, a kind of body of design knowledge. And you can only do that through a process where thinking is not guide, where thinking doesn't guide doing, but where thinking is a form of doing. I'm just gonna read this very, very quickly. So I, I think the best illustration of this, of the most exciting form of design thinking comes in Peter Rice's 
a uh, wonderful posthumously published book, An Engineer Imagines. It's from 1994, although uh, that's just when the book is published. It's published after he, he died. Uh, this is what he writes about engineering innovation. He says, probably every solution put forward by an engineer has some unusual element, some feature that could be called innovative but is not recognized because it is buried in an otherwise conventional solution. And if we examine the nature of these otherwise innovative or inventive elements, we will find that it is just the result of the engineer being intelligent or sensible about the way some detail has always been, and in so reassessing the problem from another point of view. Rice puts a lot of emphasis on reassessing the problem from another point of view. Rice here reveals in this rather short passage the key to understanding the engineer's design process. Rather than design alternative solutions to the problem at hand, the engineer instead reassesses and reposes the problem from another point of view. Engineering problems, he says, are shaped by objective parameters. And so each problem has only one solution. That is why the problem must be approached with an intelligence that comes from knowing about the problem and the way, quote, it has always been, as well as knowing and understanding various solutions to an array of similar problems and, object and the objective parameters that shape them. Engineering innovations come, he says, not because the engineer goes looking for innovative solutions. The engineer does not go looking for innovations. Rather, they result from the engineer shaping and reshaping the problem, because the problem only has one solution. Solutions are not always final solutions for the engineer and are often more important in helping lead the engineer to more clearly define the problem than his designs in their own right. It is this sensible approach that in fact design, that, that defines the engineer's disposition toward the problem. As each problem is shaped by objective parameters, so then are these parameters shaped by a particular point of view. And it is just these points of view that the engineer considers and reconsiders in shaping each proposed solution until finally the right problem emerges. Not the right solution, the right problem emerges. Invoking the title of Rice's book, we could say that the engineer imagines alternatives that reveal what the design solution might be depending on which parameters are considered in posing the problem. Breaking with the what is in pursuit of the what if, the engineer uses the design to think through and solve problems. Knowing which parameters, which what if, to work with and in what ways is enhanced and expanded with every new problem the engineer poses and solves, whether it results in an innovation or not. Even within the framework of a single design problem, each parametric change and subsequent uh, question and solution increases the engineer's design knowledge or intelligence about a material, a structure, or a process. And this knowledge can become important in other or future problems when adjusting the parameters that shapes uh, those problems. The rewards of innovation extend then beyond the immediate problem at hand and become engines for creating new design knowledge that further enhances the engineer's ability to design innovative solutions. Rice ultimately leaves us to draw the surprising conclusion that design drives innovation rather than the other way around. And it, it is this incredibly powerful insight that offers the key to developing new values for new design, especially for design education. As state and municipal budgets become ever more lean as a result of the economic downturn, educational institutions, especially publicly funded ones, must become more competitive, more innovative, and more responsible to the citizens they were originally intended to serve. Design and architecture schools have a unique opportunity to transform these new values of design into new actions that serve their institutions and constituencies as well as the larger economic and societal objectives and responsibilities of professional design practices. Articulating and developing these actions, whether at a design institute in Los Angeles, a private college in an Ivy League institution, or in a publicly funded in, uh, state university is among the most important responsibilities of design educators. I have something else to read, but I'm done. Uh, thank you very much.
This is the question that Jeff did not w want to have asked or answer, but uh, it's a question about, oh, I'm, I'm not worried. I'm not worried. Uh, it's a question about criticism. Well, you know, I, uh, look, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 um, this period you know, from the 18th century to yesterday uh, should be studied. It's, it's extremely important as history. Is it still operational as, as, inter as, a, as a means of intervention in design practice, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think so. Except, well, let me just say. Um, so, l l first off, let me separate um, the idea of these intellectual paradigms from criticism or writing about them. What I, what I, I mean, I've written a bunch of articles for Record and a lot of other journals, essentially criticizing this paradigm from the 1960s to the 1990s for not being in touch with, in fact, what was happening at the technological and at the design level. So, for example, I was at SciArc for about 10 years. And, and one of the things that you see uh, or that we saw initially when um, I, I went there, Neil Denari hired me to go to SciArc to become the graduate program head. And I went there, and uh, when I first went there, the Neil's ambition was to make the entire school digital. And, it, and we had a lot of people, a few people who were for that and a lot of people who hated it, and it was like this for a, for some time, for a long time. Um, what started, and, and, and some of the things were very apparent, I mean things that you know already, which is that um, Syrac is a school known for physical making, for model making, you know, three o'clock in the morning you go in the wood shop and there'd be some person in there melting lead and dripping it on something and burning it to see what, it, I mean just, there's just psychotic things going on, good psychotic things, crazy things going on all the time there. Because it was a school of making, there was this initial kind of with the digital paradigm. This, uh, when you do thesis at SciArc in the final year, all the students kind of join together. They make the models together. It's, like a, it's a production. Everybody sits around in a circle. When the, w you obviously know that when, when you go to the, when, you, when we make the switch to the digital paradigm, people go from sitting in a circle and making models to standing in front of the plotter and waiting for it to spit it out. Um, so you go from this kind of collective to the singular thing. Um, and that took a while for, that, for, for, for things to change. What really made things start to change there, and I don't think it happened at UCLA in the same way because UCLA was not a school, I'm just comparing LA schools. UCLA was not a school that was obsessed with making in the same way that SciArc was. What changed at SciArc was when the screen met the output technologies, the 3D printers and all that, and finally people had a way to think and do and create this kind of iterative prototyping means of designing. Um, and so still, still, however, uh, a lot of that kind of hung on because what, you know, uh, th that is to say the old sort of idea of having a great idea, physically manifesting it in a model, and that's it. I mean, that, uh, the, first, the first couple of uh, digital studios that were done at SARC were essentially uh, 21st century design technology and hardware used to output uh, uh, models uh, that then had car paint sort of slapped on them, so just sort of cool objects. The, the, the whole mechanism of using these tools as a way of thinking didn't really, didn't really take effect there for, for some time and really maybe still hasn't fully sort of happened there. I, so I say all this by, as a way to say that at the, at the time all this is going on, people are, what are they reading and thinking about in their history theory classes? They're reading Beatrice Colomina, and they're reading Martin Heidegger, and they're reading Habermas. All the debt, well, all the, oh, Jeff said that. Um, they're, they're reading, in other words, there's a, they, are, they are intellectually involved in a paradigm that is completely disconnected, I would say, from the paradigm of design that they're learning and the disconnection is between a paradigm that's driven uh, where thought guides action to one where thought and action become part of an iterative cycle. So what, what I've been writing a lot about and, 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 and kind of arguing for is a new intellectual paradigm 
that will correspond to the way in which people are actually designing. And those, those arguments that are made in that 60s, 90s period don't get there. They don't do that. I don't know where we are. I don't know what, you know, I think we're in the middle of building that kind of intellectual paradigm. So that's, so, so I would say there's a distinction though to be made between those historical paradigms and what you're asking about, which is criticism. And that is uh, writing about those paradigms. Criticism has to go on, it will go on. It's taken lots of forms. Um, I mean, we have everything from building blog, which is just kind of ruminations on crazy J.D. Ballardian stuff to whatever that's not criticizing or make, taking critical account of pieces of architecture or objects in the way that criticism used to. But still, it'll go on. Criticism will go on. I don't, I mean, I, I, I feel obligated uh, as an educator to, uh, to educate people about that historical paradigm. I don't feel any obligation that we teach students those paradigms as though they were still operational. Anything can be used, but, but, but the premises of that, of that, say, 60s to 90s paradigm, in my view, um, is, is more harmful than good unless it's simply thought of as uh, recent history that can, uh, that, that, that can be leveraged to show, to make distinctions between things. So moreover, moreover, I know a number of schools uh, have departments of criticism. I think you all have just started, or you have one. Uh, those are fantastic. Uh, we don't want any part of that. We, 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 uh, we, I do not want master's degrees of, his, of criticism in history at, at, at our college. Uh, I know Bob Somo just started one of these at UIC. And we, we'd be happy to hire some of those people, but we don't want to train them. Um, Jeff. Okay, go ahead. I know the answer to the first two. Yeah. Oh, that's one question. It's very complicated. You said they were simple. Okay. Of existential value. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll want that kind of reformulated, but let me go for the first two. Um, <laughs> no, I am not a bullshitter uh, because I'm not trying to sell anything. Yeah, so I, I don't have an agenda. We'll put it that way, and you can believe that or not. But that's so. So, I, I, no, no, I'm just saying. So I don't think of myself in that way. Um, okay, well then, that's one of the differences between us. Um, so, uh, no, I'm not a bullshitter. Who is the biggest bullshitter? Uh, I think, hands down, is, at least in my own limited experience, is Peter Eisenman. I, think, I, th I don't think anybody is even close. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, second, so that was one question. Second question uh, was, uh, I personally, just as personal, um, it doesn't have to do with what I think about my school. I, could, I just don't have any interest in, the, in answering the question or, or, or completing the sentence. Architecture is fill in the blank. In my, in my opinion, uh, that blank is filled in in this modernist period, and it's filled in here. And Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say why I answered the way that I did. There are a lot of people who are interested, for example, I just did an interview with Bob uh, at Fre in Fresh Meat, and we talked specifically about this. There are a lot of people who are very interested in the discipline of architecture. What is it, and how does it define itself? Um, and they're interested in that history of the discipline of architecture. I, I, I am completely uninterested in that because that's a, that is a question that follows from architecture is, because in order to define the discipline, you have to define what architecture is. And it's a history of the ways in which architecture has been defined over periods of time. I, I, it's, it's an interesting historical question, but uh, personally, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in architecture as a means, uh, as, 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 as a design practice, but I'm not interested in architecture and in defining the discipline and trying to understand its history 
especially in relationship to where we are right now. I, I would, for example, just as another example, or as another way of answering that, I would not be interested in the job I have now if it were a dean of a college of architecture. Um, I'm interested in the job in, in precisely because it's a college of design. Yes. Well, it means you have to have a body of knowledge. In order to have a problem, it's worth the pain and the problem of architecture is what Rice actually argues is in fact that architects don't proceed in that way. Yeah, well, well uh, in a, uh, I sort of pointed to some examples um, after I showed Jesse's RUR as a, as a kind of a retort to the architecture for humanity kind of argument. And what I wanted to show in those examples were very specific products and designs that we were engaging in that come out of a, a need, a desire, and uh, kind of an unavoidable um, relationship to coal. We live in a state where coal is uh, is very powerful. Uh, uh. That's why what? You want to get rid of Kentucky because we have a better basketball team than you do. Which one? Those are actually uh, cufflinks. Yeah, made out of the state of Kentucky, and um, actually we have. Uh, we have uh, fly ash, uh, we have silver, and we have gold models. Uh, and you can see there's a little hole there placed where we made the one for this, this client, Henderson, Kentucky. But they ended up buying a gold, a gold model with a, with a little diamond in there. Um, yeah? No, 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 no. no. The, the, the existential question is extremely important, or the answer to that is extremely important because all the projects I wanted to show are the, or, 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 or let's say the kinds of design solutions and objects and materials we we're working with are very specific to Kentucky. They are problems that come out of having to deal with... with Could be, except every, I mean, except every architect that doesn't work in that way today will not be working very long. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, the being only once of architecture has probably been only once and probably won't be again. And it, it doesn't have a very long shelf life, I don't think, today. No, it's done, though. Is it as pedestrian as Jeff's was simple? <laughs> no, no. Well, I'll, I'll explain my column. Uh, intelligence is the transformation of chatter, which is lots and lots and lots of data into intelligible patterns that can be used for things.
maybe, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 let me let me offer just uh, a pedestrian answer and say that um, BIM and parametric design is another way to think about this. It's not simply producing lots and lots and lots of copies or multiple iterations, although it can be that. It, it is also the, the 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 idea that making certain kinds of moves in a design will have parametric repercussions and other parts of the design. And that has a huge, huge benefit for costing, for construction, for, so. Uh, okay, I, I, this is not an argument, this is not really an argument for some kind of bottom-up revolution. It's an, it's an argument that says, as architects, as designers, you have always been doing this. When you have a studio brief, it will say, this is the site, this is the program, this is, these are the materials, three weeks from now, I want to see A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Well, those are parameters, and what you do as a designer is you, you produce what that would look like if, in fact, those were the parameters. And, of course, they have to be because that's what your instructor says they are. So when you make a, when you make a design, you are, make, you are essentially prototyping what that – design would be or what that would be, what that product would be if those parameters that are, that you're given to begin with are in fact the defining ones. What I'm, what I'm saying is that with technology and even, and the reason I showed the Fena Hockenma Wagner, uh, the, the, the Rems Nice piece, uh, is to show that it's not just digital, that this in fact is something that people have been doing for a while and, and, and it's a paradigm that's not completely dependent on that, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's also not to say that you'll get a better design. It might be that you'll get a job. It might be that actually you can make a more compelling argument. It might, it might mean a lot of things, but it, it may not mean that you're going to make a better design proper. It, it may not mean that, um, but, it, but it, I think it, it will allow you to make an argument that uh, what you're producing is adding value to a client's uh, uh, brief. And, and, and in that sense, I don't think that's you're doing anything different than you do in a studio every week. Well, I would say if you don't believe in what you're doing, you're trying to sell something. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm. I'm. I'm I, uh, Uh, yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. But if you believe that there is such thing as a discipline of architecture and that it has integrity, then you will want to believe in that and you will not want to sell it or sell anything simply to get people to do things. That's true. That is true. That is true. No, uh, 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 no, I, I don't think architects are necessarily bullshitters. Um, I would, I, I think that, I think the ones who win competitions, I think the ones that are successful, I think the ones that are redefining where the practice is going today, I think they are engaged in uh, a practice of producing design knowledge that they, that they can draw on like Peter Rice is arguing to reformulate problems to create solutions that in fact people will pay for. No. 
Could be. A lot of it could have been produced by idealists. It undoubtedly is. It undo well, let, me, let me just say this, that the, that, the, that, that, the real, that the real argument here is not about objects, it's not about buildings, it's about practices. It's about, it's about making, it's, it's an argument for, for a more, uh, let's say, robust, transformational uh, model of practice that can actually engage with the world as it's changing and, and, and moving around today. Go, go. Of qualities. Um, we, sure, sure. I, or, 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 